Presentation was recorded live in Cincinnati, Ohio, for Color Lab's 25th Annual Convention. This is Tape 20, Multi-Cycle Teaching. This is the uh, session on multi-cycle teaching, and we'd like to give you our experiences on this particular program, give you some information on it, and also be able to share with others your experiences with the same program. Just as a show of hands, how many of you are presently using some form of multi-cycle plan in your lessons? Good, about half the group. Okay, super. Uh, why don't we start out by introducing uh, some of my illustrious panel here, and, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the general plan for those of you that, that uh, are coming for some information. How many of you here have never tried this plan but are somewhat interested, maybe a possibility of using it someplace? Okay, great, great. Um, let's start out. We'll give you some information before I would go too much further. Let me introduce to uh, my left uh, from Kansas is uh, Dana Shermer, his wife Donna. Thank you guys for coming out. A nice hand for Dana and Donna. So to my right uh, from Shreveport, then Dallas, and on to the West Coast eventually is Nasser Shuker. Nasser? My name is Mike Seastrom, and uh, I'm from the Los Angeles area, north of Los Angeles in California. We've been doing this multi-cycle plan for about two and a half years now. This is a program that works. This is, I think, one of the one of the best things to happen in square dancing in a long time, and it's by no means new. This particular document that we have handed out today, this multi-cycle lesson plan, is a document that's available from Caller Lab. I refer a lot of people to the Caller Lab office to pick up this document. Um, the particular club that I work with in doing this multi-cycle program, uh, I send representatives from that club to the clubs in the area out and discuss this plan with the clubs. I used to go out myself to all the associations and talk to people, but it seems that if you're in an area that is predominantly and politically controlled by the clubs, that it's the message is just much better heard when you have club people talking to club people and I found out that I was much more successful and we've got approximately eight to ten groups now in the greater Los Angeles area that are using this plan most of them are using it in one particular method but that's because of the environment and the weather and and uh, and the, the the influx of people and the time that people have in in our particular area uh, let me just kind of say one thing about this plan before we get started. Why don't you guys sit down here? We, I guess we can all sit down. Go. Um, let me just say one thing about this. This plan is, is incredibly flexible. You can use it in a variety of ways. You're not stuck to one particular way of, of doing it. We do find that there are some constants about multi-cycle teaching that, that seem to make it go and keep the momentum going. One of the problems that we we have encountered with groups that try this and then stop after one or two starts is they never get the momentum going that keeps this thing that makes this thing work and part of that is starting multiple times in my opinion if you can start initially say in, in September with this and then start your second group either 12 weeks later or 17 weeks later or 13 weeks later or, or even 10 weeks later you're using your new dancer base to recruit their friends to become your new dancers. And that's the key of this program. It's instead of constantly working on your club people to go out, you're using your new people to gather their friends and angel their friends and dance with their friends right away. In angeling with their friends in the, the second phase of this class, it enables your people that started and recruited their friends to repeat the basics that they have learned in the previous class. At the same time, they're the smart ones. They're angeling, and, and there's a momentum that's picked up from repeated starts. So there, there's a real key to starting this and doing this enough times where you pick up momentum. The second thing that I wanted to point out was you still have to recruit or promote your class in ways that we've discussed before, in ways that you'll see in the Legacy Promo Pack. The RPM Committee has information on ways to recruit your class. That's almost an entirely different subject, but we can get into that a little bit later if you'd like. Uh, but for the, the purposes of this this discussion, it might be better to just keep our, our thoughts on multi-cycle lesson plans and the different ways that they can be run. There are, like I said before, so many ways that you can run this particular program. And I'd like to start out by having Dana talk uh, about how he and Donna run their particular program, how the makeup is, and how it works for them. Okay, Dana? Thank you, Mike. First of all, I want to say uh, thank you all, all of you for coming into the meeting, and also my 
my thanks to Mike and Nassar for letting me sit on the panel with them. It's kind of a privilege for a country boy like myself to come in with these big city guys. <laughs> um, multiple, multiple sessions for me have, is nothing new. I've been doing this, I've been calling 20 years, and I've been doing multiple sessions for 20 years. Um, out, out of necessity, I call for three mainstream clubs, and I've called for those three clubs for years. And uh, each club won their own set of lessons, and there's hardly enough time to start out new lessons in September for three clubs and keep your sanity. So what I did was came to an agreement I was going to do them periodically. Now it's not, I did not keep the true 12 weeks or 14 weeks or something like that. I've picked a time, this is when we're going to start our lessons. But I normally did at least three lessons plans a year. Uh, up to now, I'm probably doing four or five set a, a, a year. Uh, some of that depends on our timing and what we have planned for the for the summer months and so forth. But that's where we where we've come from. We've learned how to use the multiple sessions mainly because of necessity. Um, is it is it workable? Yes. Is it good? Yes. Is it the complete answer to square dancing's problem? No. But it's a good tool. It's a way of turning things around. Uh, as I said, we've done this for years. Um, We've had some dancers saying, well, we do too many sets of lessons. We're, we're half an angels for too many sets of lessons. Um, proof, though, came just recently. We did a district dance for the new dancers, 10 foot dancers. One third of the dancers, out of 40 clubs in the district, one third of the dancers came from my classes. So I think that opened people's eyes to say, yeah, it works. Is a complete answer. I'm not completely satisfied yet, but we're working at it. Uh, where other clubs are not having lessons, I'm having lessons, three and four a year. So it does work to that degree. I still would like to have more, more people, that is. And part of that is I hope to get some other callers involved with me to work with it. But right now, it's kind of a standalone program that my wife and I are working with the clubs with, and we're, we're making it work this way. Um, part of the reason it works for us, too, is I take complete responsibility for the lessons. I arranged that with the clubs when I first started, that I would pay the rent, I would arrange the time, and so forth. All I would ask them to be there and and beat angels. We've set up the time and work with them the best we can. But when it comes down to lessons, I, I make the calls for it. And uh, so I didn't have a lot of club problems with that. We uh, they understood that going into our lessons that, that I would be in charge. The, um, of course, as Mike was saying, the benefits... People are taking classes right now. When you start a new class, they can come out and be angels. They can promote for, for your new classes. And it also gives them that refresher to go back and look at and say, hey, yeah, I didn't quite get that out of the first set of lessons. The first time I went through that, I didn't quite understand that. Now I understand it. Um, they're the, the class people are our most productive people for recruiting. They're the ones that are excited about the activity at this time. They know the most people out there that have not tried square dancing yet, so they're out there pushing to bring more people in. And uh, as, as I said before, it kind of works as a workshop for those people who have been out dancing. Um, I invite people that have been out dancing for about four or five years, and we've talked to and say, well, we'd like to get back in, but we would have to go through lessons. Come back out and be angels. You know, come in the last half of the sessions. You don't have to go through the first session. Come through the last half. You can be an angel, and it works that way too. The big benefit is also you don't have to start in September. You can start in January. You can start in April, whenever it's best for you and your family. Um, as I said, one of the negatives is we do have people say, well, it's too many lessons. We can't come out and help with lessons that many nights. I don't force people to. I tell you, come when you can. Come when you can come two or three times during the whole set of lessons, do it. Um, we perform a little bit different than probably Mike and NASA in the fact that I start a set of lessons on Tuesday nights. 12, 15 weeks later, I start another set. But it'll be on Sunday night. And the people who are working on Tuesday night can come over on Sunday night and help. Um, some people like to go back to back. They'll start one in the, in the evening and start one later on in the later part of the night. That's fine. It works for them. In my case, my halls will not allow for that. They have to close at 9 o'clock or something like that. Well, I can't, I can't get to the hall early enough and do three-hour session and be out by 9 o'clock. I just can't do it. And I don't expect the dancers would be able to do it. So I do one set each night and just have them different nights to, to start. Um, 
that's pretty much what's going on with our group. We, um, we've had good success and uh, a lot of help from the angels. And, uh, again, a lot of the people that need extra help, they can come out and be angels from the next group, and it works just perfect. Dana, let me just go back and forth with you here in a second. You're, you're saying that you teach lessons and start lessons on different nights, right? Yes. So you run maybe, you start, say, in September on Tuesday night or? Correct. And then? And then follow up maybe November uh, with another set starting on Sunday night. On Sunday nights? Yes. Right. And people on your Tuesday night, you encourage them in your lessons as you come to the, just before the, to bring their friends maybe to Sunday night, Correct. get their friends involved? Correct. Now it'll be be the best benefit I think the the ideal would be if they're already coming on Tuesday night they could go ahead and bring people on Tuesday night uh, that probably be better recruiting right but in my case my hall would not allow me to to be there after nine o'clock I so see I have to close down two hours of lessons that's about all I can get in so you do two hours of lessons then then if they come on Sunday night and bring bring their friends right um, do some of them ac- actually stay or maybe switch to another night Oh. They all stay on the same night that we're on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, it does work a better benefit, too. We all have had people that aren't quite getting it or missed three or four lessons in the first group. You can always say, hey, you're not going to be able to complete this. But there is another set starting tomorrow night or next week. Why don't you come and join that group? And com- that way you're not feeling like you're holding the rest of the group up. You're not slowing everybody up. You can actually... Get back into it by going to a different night, and you'd be caught up. And I think that's one of the neat parts about this program is that when somebody does fall behind or misses several weeks and has a problem, you know, instead of having to well go to them and say, you know, maybe you can try this set of lessons down there, you're offering them a solution. You're not telling them they must leave, but hey, why don't you come on Sunday night, or why don't you come to? We have a different setup but it's the same kind of thing you can ask them to come a, a different time and, and encourage them uh, the other thing I think works great is when, when you have your new dancers recruiting their friends it's nice to walk up to those people and say God thanks for coming tonight and helping out you know and they just kind of perk right up it's nice to be the smart ones most of them will say that you know it's just great to be the ones that we know this stuff but it's also a review for them and it makes a big difference I'd like to elaborate on one other thing um, I didn't mention that it's not the answer to all the score dancing's problem you still got to go out and do the same ground floor work you always do in lessons. You still got to put out flyers. You still got to promote. You have still got to recruit. Try to get people in the score dancing. It still requires that. Um, you can sit there and say, "Well, I got these new dancers, and they'll go out and do it for me." That's narrowing things down. You just need to completely continue your program as far as promoting, recruiting. You still have to do that. So it's um, as I said, it's not the complete answer, but it's a, a tool that can help. That's exactly right. I have a question. My question has to do with uh, angeling. When you bring the second, basically the first tier gets through the first ten weeks or eight weeks or whatever the time frame is, you ask these people to come back and angel. Now, if it's on a second night or or even the same night, how do you? differentiate between the people that are angeling and the people that are having to repeat and how do you say I'm sorry you have to pay for the class again and how not to it's just a political issue I was wondering how you how you handle it if I, oh yeah your name for the tape my name is Stephen Colum are you through I'm more than through no <laughs> I've had a long standing policy myself that people do not pay for a second set of lessons. So if they go through a set of lessons, if they're in the first 12 weeks of lessons, they're coming in the second group, they're angels. I, I never charge people a second time for lessons. Um, so that we do, because we, we work our group on the same night, is, is we have different badges, different color badges, depending on which phase they're in. And, and, they, and they pay. And even if they come back and workshop, a lot of people repeat a phase. And, and they, they, if they come to dance that night, they pay one fee, whether they come for one session or both sessions or whatever. They pay the same fee. Any other questions, Will? Say your name. I'll take your, I'll take the mic and run. Okay, I'll wait. When you threw the mic, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, my name is Will Eads. I'm in California. And I wanted to ask Mike, uh, do you have your club and your class on the same evening. Is that correct? That's right. So, so your class, uh, they don't change color badges until when? 
they really don't change color badges. They keep the same badges through through the uh, whole the whole set of lessons. I the same group keep that that uh, that color badge, um, and, and I can go into how I do it in just a second. I think Nasser will go into how he does it, and then maybe afterwards we can run some questions. Um, by the way, we as you know, we want to speak in the microphone, say your name and where you're from, and uh, we'll be able to put that on the tape. Okay, let's go. Th- let me let Nasser explain how he does his lessons or how he's, his group worked in the Shreveport area, and then we can switch over. I can talk a little bit about my group, and then we can have some questions. Also, Steve uh, Stevenson's got some information on a group that he's got going. So, Nasser? Um, I was running uh, three times eight weeks to mainstream. I was running 24 weeks to uh, mainstream. Uh, the way we did it is so we had three groups. We started a class every eight weeks, every two months, you had six classes a year. Uh, if you've never square danced before, we called you the white group, and you had a white badge. Um, you came in at 8 p.m. Uh, to 9.30. And so we had a complicated little schedule. We'll get a little more to it. But basically, if you've never square danced, all you need to know is come in from 8 to 9.30, and you'll dance uh, uh, during that time. Uh, then after eight weeks, I want you to bring all your friends, and even if you don't have friends, bring people you don't like. You know, just bring everybody... And, but you come in at 7 and uh, would would dance some there, and you became the green group, which was the second eight weeks. Uh, the third eight weeks was the orange group, and uh, they would also come in at 7. So the way the way a schedule works, there was there was nine tips a night, and we had a little marker board. It was like a poster board, and, and we had a, a high-tech connector with an arrowhead that pointed to where we were in the schedule. It, and it, it, that connector looked like a, it looked like a clothespin, but it was a connector. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I've seen those before. Yeah, connectors. It, yeah, they look. And, it just looks like a clothespin. Right. And so you'd move the little arrow down each tip. But anyway, the first tip was uh, for the green group. And the second tip was for the orange group. Then the green, then the orange, and that gave you from seven to eight p.m. Because we didn't do singing calls for the advanced people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> commentary there never mind okay and then then we went with a a white a green a white an orange and a white now by doing that you can run three classes a night and no one group was there for forever necessarily and 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 you also the main advantage we got to that was a social bonding because if uh, we found just in the south because because we don't have much to do down there that <laughs> that that if you if you like have a class that comes in from seven to eight thirty and another class comes in from eight thirty to ten that they could all graduate in adjacent classes and they would never know each other but this way by having the alternating tips uh, it encouraged the angeling and got them all into a cohesive unit um, there's a everyone wants to grow their squareness club and we say, okay, how do you grow it? You know, and you talk about people, uh, we know a club that had 52 students uh, this last year. Well, chances are that they didn't have 52 students the year before. They won't have 52 students next year. It was just a one-time stroke of luck. And uh, you can't really grow a club to, if you want to just go ahead and let's be honest, we want to dominate the scene. We want to be the biggest club ever, you know. And, and, and the, I think the only way to do that is by a constant small trickle of uh, of growing your club. If you have one class a year, so you have 52 uh, students one time, um, it's it's a different deal. With this concept, you got to think of, well, what's a crummy class? A small class would be just three couples. It's a disaster. Okay, do that six times a year, and you have, uh, you have what do you have? Three times six. Six squares. <laughs> okay, or something. I don't know. Anyway, but you have, you have a way... Three, six times three is eighteen. Couple, uh, four squares. I don't know. But anyway, you've got a big class. <laughs> okay. Now, what it what it does take is a commitment. You got to get the momentum going. And and another thing it takes is uh, we're coming to find out that it takes the the caller. And and the reason I say that, I know of a club in uh, in Los Angeles that that I understand that they had a motorcycle deal going, but never really quite went anywhere. And they changed callers, and uh, now they're a mega club. Have you ever heard of this club? I never. Okay, but but the, the, it's the same people, it's the same hall, it's the same night. They just changed the guy that was doing it. Now, some of it may have been that it just took a while to get the momentum going. Let's agree. I think so. It wasn't you. No, but it okay. does take. The, it, could, it does. That momentum is critical. There I've isn't. seen places where the deal is going and it's real successful, and then that caller has to leave and like move to Dallas or something, and. 
and that's right. And and the, it's the same people, it's the same club, it's the same hall, it's the same night. But the program fizzles out. They decide, well, uh, we're gonna go ahead and just teach all the way through plus once a year because it's easier. And no one has to fool with new dancers anyway. So the point is, what do we learn from this? Is that even though you've got the club in place, you've got the hall, you've got the night, you've got the dancers, it, it takes the caller. It, you can't depend on the club to do it for you. It it takes the caller to to get in there and do it and to say, well, what's the first step? You you've got to get this handout. And you got to read it. You got to study it, and that's the first step. Because you're the guy that's that's pulling the strings. If you don't get this, can I sell this program to? If you don't get this handout, I hope you can sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Nasser. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing that, that that he points out is that it does take some energy and it does take some momentum on the part of of a club. If you're working with a club or the caller and the caller, it, it does take some cohesiveness to make it work. And there are things just like a regular class that can take down this program. So it, the, you want to keep the social part of the class up. You want to keep the excitement there. Uh, as you can see from Nasser's explanation of his group in Shreveport there, he had a, a pretty complex system of running through the tips and such, and, and but it worked for him, and it worked for that group, and, and that's what, what kind of made that group grow. The, the system that that uh, I've been familiar with and the one that I've been using started out starting a class four times a year or every 13 weeks. It was set up on a schedule where we'd start in September, in January, in the end of April, and in July. Um, After a year of running it that way, actually after two years of running it that way, we had discovered that our July recruitment was just tough. We just had a tough time starting the class in July. We decided, let's expand this and we'll go to 17 weeks, and now we do 17 weeks. And we start in September, we start in January, and we start at the beginning of May. And those three times a year, surprisingly, we find that we can recruit the most new dancers during the springtime, the end of April, beginning of May. It's daylight savings time right now. It's just a neat time to recruit people. People come home from work, it's light outside, they're ready to do something, and, and and I find that that's a great time to recruit them. We have a little bit of a tougher time in the summertime, but uh, uh, and, and I should say, in my mind, that's the only disadvantage. I'd love to have a few days in the summertime off, but we keep it going all the way through the year. And it, it works this way. We have a, a church that we use. The hall has air conditioning, so it allows us to go all year round. It does help to keep the momentum if you can do it all year. Okay, You don't have to, but it does help the momentum to keep it going that way if you can. The thing that we found out is that when you start the thing, the class in September, say you're just starting out for the first time, you can, and, and the way we begin was from 7 to 8.30, and we work from 7 to 10 in the night. From 7 to 8.30, we would start our new class. From 8.30 to 10, the first time we started it, we had just a workshop for club members, and, and we did styling and some different positioning, and but it was to get the club people out there and to get them to help the new dancers. The second program that we started in January, we took the group that was dancing from 7 to 8.30 and we shifted them from that time to 8.30 to 10. Our new group that we brought in, we brought them in from from 7 to uh, 8.30 again, and now we had two classes going on the same night. In 17 weeks, I would go through the basic program. The destination program in, uh, in the Southern California area is plus. We don't have mainstream clubs, unfortunately, so the halfway point is the basic program. At the halfway point, the club that I call for has on their regular dance night, which is once a month, has alternating tips for their class and their club. Uh, The club literally has made a commitment that we're going to focus our energy on our new dancers and our new dancer program. And in doing so, their dancers, by the halfway point, are, are in in the feel of the club. Uh, the other thing that works well is that the club invites these people to their theater nights, they invite them to picnics, they invite them to campouts. The newsletters contain the names and the birthdays and the anniversaries of your class people. Uh, they're included right away in the club. Uh, they get a club badge, it has a little swinger on it, and it just indicates the color-wise that they're in phase one or phase two. And and it, it, it it incorporates those people into the club right away. And I think that's another key to this whole program, is, or to any class, is include them in the activities, invite them to your social events and anything else that's going on that just gets them into the feel of the club. By the time that the group, we start again in April or May, 
uh, the group from September, we literally graduate that group at that point in time and start a new group. We invite these people, once they graduate, to come back as workshop dancers. Okay, They pay. If they come back to workshop, they pay. They still angel. But a lot of them at this point in time are still learning the phase of calls. By the, by the time of January, they can come to both phases if they want. The other advantage to this, it reminds me right now, is that when they first start dancing, we dance an hour and a half long in each phase. And an hour and a half, I find, is plenty of time for most people. Um, particularly if it's it's the first time they've been dancing or they haven't been doing a lot of physical activity. An hour and a half is just about enough. And when they walk out the door, they're not tired. They're not fatigued. They just want a little more. And it's kind of nice when they walk out the door, kind of chomping at the bit a little bit, like, oh, I could have danced another couple tips. And that's great because the next phase, they can dance both tips. They come back to Angel, and most of them come back, and they're excited to come to both parts of the night. And uh, if they don't want to come the entire first phase, they may come at, say, 8 o'clock and dance 8 to 8.30 and, and stay till 10 o'clock. So we find that, that leaving them wanting more is a real, real help in motivating them and keeping them coming back to class. We, uh, Like I say, we run the program two, two cycles a night and, um, and then have them back to workshop. If somebody gets behind, we encourage them to repeat the same phase. If, if I have dancers that are going to go on to the second phase, but I feel they're not ready, it's really easy for me or club members to say, why don't you stay with phase one? Make sure you feel comfortable with it. Most of them are relieved that they don't really have to go on and feel like, oh, God, I have to go on to the next. And I say this throughout the class. If you're feeling like you're a little overwhelmed, don't feel like you have to move on to the next phase, we'd love to have you come back and help our next group. And I make sure that they know that they're helping out the next group. And I think this really this helps an awful lot. If a dancer from a previous phase is coming back and, and angeling a previous group, I make sure to get out to the class and thank them for coming. Thanks for coming and helping out. This, you, I really appreciate you guys coming early and, and being here because it, it helps them, but it also, they're not so jaded as angels that they've, they're doing the flashy styling and some of that stuff that you have to calm some of your angels down. They're, they're, they're tuned into the class people. They're helping the people. They remember what it's like going through this phase because they just went through it. And so it's a great reinforcement tool for them. And at the same time, they're, they're great angels. So once again, keeping this thing going on a regular basis and encourage them as you get to the end of one phase. Say, hey, gang, we're starting a new phase coming up uh, May 13th. Uh, make sure you bring your new friends. We're looking forward to it. we got flyers out here. Take those flyers with you. As you notice, this flyer will give your, your dancers a, a, a free first night. Have them come and just uh, uh, enjoy dancing with us. And that's exactly what they'll do is that they'll take those flyers out to their friends. The flyer is good for a free night, and they come back and invite their friends, and, and it helps to recruit. So, you guys want to make any other comments about anything else that adds to your program? Dana? Well, NASA hit on one, one major item. It takes a commitment from the caller. It takes a commitment from the dancers involved with the clubs. It takes a, a big commitment to, to continue these type of lessons. Um, but there's some benefits to it. As I said, there's, you're getting more dancers into your group. There's um, more. Uh, to me, uh, the, the most fun in score dancing is the Learn to Dance program. And... There's so much excitement there and, and newness that it's always a pleasure just to watch new dancers come through the process of learning. And uh, so I encourage you to kind of step up that ideal. And, and if you haven't committed to, to multiple sessions before, look at it real strong because there's a lot of enthusiasm there. Now, so you want to make some comments here? No, I got nothing to say. No, I'm kidding. Um, if if I could, if I could start a brand new uh, multicycle uh, session, which I, I will in uh, September in another state, um, see I've done it for years and I know about some of the pitfalls and politics and stuff and and things that to watch out for and say what would I do different from what I did before that was successful because uh, it is hard to get it changed in a way uh, once you get it started and get the club members used to it and say we want to change it no don't change it you know they're used to it the way it is. Uh, what I would change from the beginning, I was talking with another caller, and he's a real famous guy, and I forgot his name, but <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, what I would do different, each class that started, I would give them the full club badge, not a little temporary club badge, not a paper sticker that says, hi, my name is, is Biff, you know, or, or whatever, I would, and no one's named Biff. I've never met a Biff. No, me either. Okay, I would give them a real club badge, and the difference in the badge is it would have a dangle bar below it. 
And that dangle bar would be a color and a name that they picked. In order that that group got together and decided we're the the road runners, you know, and, and we're the twirling dervishes, uh, we're we're the the fun bunch or whatever. It would have like for the fun bunch, 1998, and and then that would be their little dangle. Then when they graduated, they would lose the dangle. It would take it away, and now they're a full-fledged club member because because they didn't have the dangle, or on or let them go ahead and just keep them like some people. You go to the nationals. You ever met? You ever met that old woman at nationals where her badge is so long it drags the ground? Have you met that I've woman? Met, I've met her. Yes. That, I would like my angels to look like that, and they would have they would have a badge for each class that they angel. But take one of the badges that says like Road Runners 1998 and make a plaque. And uh, put that plaque on the wall, and eventually on the wall would have all these different classes, you know. And 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 that's that's one thing that I would do different. Um, I think that everyone should commit to this thing to three cycles. Nord, you might get going in your first cycle. You get a class going, it looks good. Your second cl- cycle, maybe good or bad, but then you have a third cycle, and it's just a disaster. You only have like one person show up, you know. And I th- I think you should go ahead and and commit and see this thing through. I mean, it's not like. You're going to do something else different on that night because you're committed to the other two classes and and go and get the momentum going because what happens after you've done it for a period of time, it becomes easier to scare up a class. And I don't know if that's because the momentum's going your way and these people are going out and finding new people, or is it because you've had more practice scaring up a class? You know, if you scare up a class six times a year, uh, you become good at it. Um, and and another comment one dancer told me one time. Um, is a time where where I looked at over the last three years in Streetport, out of all of the new dancers that were put into the system, I'd personally put uh, about 90% of all the new dancers in the system. And someone that's been dancing a long time told me, you know, uh, dancing in, in Streetport is just the level is so diluted. That's what they said. The level is so diluted here lately. And uh, I told her, I'm I'm guilty of that. I did it. Uh, I put ten squares of new dancers into the system over the last three years, and and so this is like, let's make this our motto. Let's let's dilute the level. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we also have uh, a comment or a program that uh, Steve Stevenson does, and you've got the handout. I think if you don't already have it, you might touch base with Donna. She's got some additional handouts up here. Are there some handouts in the back too? Do you need some additional handouts back there? All right. Steve, why don't you come up here? Hang and have a seat up here if you want. And, uh, yeah, there's some additional handouts Donna's got in the back back in there. And maybe we can have Steve talk a little bit about uh, about his program. As you can see, there are multiple ways of running this. All uh, all three of us do it in a different way. And, Steve, I imagine your system's just a little bit different. So, so listen up close here, Steve Stevenson. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Steve Stevenson. I'm out of the uh, Washington, D.C. area, and uh, uh, actually uh, out of Fairfax, Fairfax City. The, uh, so a couple of three years ago, some dancers come up to me and indicated that they would like to, uh, to do some special ways of teaching things. And uh, I'd like to uh, slowly mention what kind of dancers came up to do that people who had been festival directors in our Waska Festival in that area, people who had been uh, directors of the state conventions and things like that, are real worker bees and leaders in the square dance community in that area. So uh, I uh, said, well, we have started talking about it, and I noted two things. When I had my lessons out with Chuck and Dayton, they had a, a dance council out there that sponsored the, uh, the classes, uh, they hired the caller to teach the classes, and the caller uh, would teach the classes, and then any club could come in and uh, at our graduation and provide invitations to the dancers to go to their club. And so we talked about that, and they said, well, let, let's see what we can do about it. Now, uh, this little piece of paper that I passed out is just sort of the, a prospectus which says how we do things. First of all, it's a 12-12-12 program. It's a concept to train our new dancers to be plus dancers in 36 weeks using two and a half hour sessions. They got plenty of benefits for this particular concept. Uh, first, the reason that we have to do uh, go to plus is that the uh, the predominant dance in the Washington area is plus dancing. We have maybe one or two or three small 
uh, mainstream clubs. Kenny's got a fairly good sized club, but there's not too many around there. So there's a benefit to be able to get through it in a one class year. Secondly, we provide with the two and a half hour sessions, we're able to go through and provide the recommended 60, uh, 60 hours to mainstream and, uh, and 30 hours to plus. So we can handle that still in nine months. It's a quarter based system. And it allows interested dancers to join the class while, the interest, while their interest is high. They don't have to wait till the spring. Students who uh, don't quite meet the grade, or so not meet the grade is not the word, uh, that would be useful for them to go back and do it again, they have the opportunity to recycle and do it again. Uh, we do uh, charge the recycles, to, uh, but we give it to them, at, uh, I think, at the, for a while at... Uh, at half price, and then we've, uh, we've, I think we've moved that up just a little bit. But otherwise, that's the way we're handling it. We have the, the three sessions. Then, if you take a look at the piece of paper down below, you see what we're doing with that. Each of those lines is one caller taking one class for nine months. We start them in September, December, March, and June. Now then, each caller starts them in those types of calls. For example, uh, when I did my first class, I did the September class. In May, I needed to go for another class. You will see that down at 3 June. Uh, what, it, wasn't, it wasn't 3 June or 3 June last year, but I've come back and started a summer class. When the December come up, a man, uh, one of our callers named Bill Addison, uh, uh, decided to come with us, and he started our second class. And he graduated his class last September. Unfortunately, Bill did pass away in, uh, in January, and uh, Mr. Bruce Mitchell over here uh, took his place, and he's one of the callers on our group, too. Okay, that's the general idea, but we go through. We have three classes going in one hall at all times. Now, the hall has soundproof barriers, uh, soundproof walls between them. We cannot hear each other. The real unique in, that I think about these uh, three halls and three different levels is I remember the days when I was in high school. I went in as a sophomore. I looked up to the seniors, and we all I got to know every one of them. By the time I graduated, I didn't remember any, how many of, the, many of the sophomore names, but I knew all the rest of them. And we find that interaction between the dancers, between the main mainstream program, the basic mainstream and plus program. Okay, how do we organize this thing? As I said, I formed it with a group that were dedicated square dancers and hard worker bees. We gave it, set it up as a, a teaching council. We put 17 members on the council. Nothing sacred about 17 members to get insurance and get sort of sort of a club status, we had to have two squares so uh, to go into the association. So they gave us our basic 16, and we added one more to that and on the council. It also gave us the insurance we would need to protect ourselves and that type of thing. The uh, caller, the council selects the callers, hires the callers, and pays the callers. Now, how do we advertise? We advertise by flyers, advertisements in the dancer magazines, uh, Newspapers, we can get some in the Washington Post, and we've we've got fair response from that. But the old standby is still word of mouth and walking up to one of your friends, put your arm around him, and said, "Brother, let me talk to you about square dancing." And that still is about the best way you can. You remember. bet. You bet. That's the best way you can do it. Uh, Steve, if I understand you right, now you've, you're doing this all, all on the same night in the same facility. That's right. And not and, and it's it's the dancers kind of kind of run the thing and the, dan- and the, the dancers are running. The, okay. the, the dancer they, they're, they're selected people on the council. We have to vote them to bring them on the council. Sure. You know, but sure. That's kind of stuff. Okay. All right. And it's possible though that even if you didn't have a facility like this, that three different callers and three different clubs could work together in the same fashion. Could same they? fashion, maybe in different schools. Or many schools have uh, more than one room in them. You know. Right. <laughs> you, could, you could just get this in a, a school. That's right. Sure. It's not that hard. Uh, Anyhow, the bottom line was that the uh, we've got our, our flyers. One of the things we found with flyers, I found that uh, I can go down to Staples, have Xeroxed a uh, thousand flyers for twenty bucks, 
flood those in a neighborhood. If I get one per person from that thousand flyers, it only eats up about half of his entry fee. So I feel it's very important to do two things, have a lot of flyers, and also distribute them in the housing areas where people will get them. Second thing we do, the uh, a member of our council becomes the what we call a class coordinator, one or two of those. One's to run the, to run the class itself, to keep the stats up, uh, call people up, and generally work with the caller throughout that period of their, their, dan- their dance experience uh, as class coordinators. The third thing, we've talked about angels. Uh, we have an angel coordinator. We have 71 people at this time that have volunteered to be angels, not on every night, but as available in an angel pool. And so they, uh, uh, they, they check in with the angel coordinator, and the angel coordinator uh, assigns them to the halls where we need uh, angels to fill out the, the, the students. And secondly, they must be qualified to dance at that level uh, as an angel. So we hold that kind of type. Uh, basic, uh, we started seven basic classes so far. We started the, first, the last one this, uh, early in, uh, in uh, March. Uh, we've had six classes so far in mainstream. We've had five classes so far in plus. The first year input, the first four classes we went through, we had a total of seven squares through that bunch. Uh, the output counting recycles, counting retreads, was 14 squares. Uh, we, if I take the uh, recycles and say, well, they weren't new dancers or had not come in from, from the woods somewhere, I, can, I estimate we had about 11 squares in that bunch. So it, our, our results were about 11, which was a lot better than I had seen in a long time, and that was uh, about with three callers working, about three and two-thirds squares as we went through. So I thought that was pretty nice. Very good, Steve. Yeah. Some kind of, wait, wait, hold on. Let me get you hooked up to the mic. And <laughs> okay, my name is Bruce Mitchell. And I'm the second caller or the other caller on this program. And I wanted to – there's probably nothing I could add to what Steve is saying about the actual mechanics of the program. However, I did want to mention um, – Early on, they had invited me to participate in the program, and uh, my response was, well, I don't really want to call another night of the week. Uh, and that sounds like an excellent program, and I certainly hope you could find a third caller to, to fill the billet. Um, one night, they, said to, they came to me and they said, uh, listen, we're having a graduating class here, and would you like to come over and just promote your club, you know, give them a free night to uh, dance or whatever? I said, okay, well, I'll go. It's, you know, sounds like an interesting program. Uh, when I went in there, the, it was kind of a festival kind of atmosphere. Um, you could do this in three different facilities and, uh, and certainly make it work, but I think uh, what is, what is uh, most helpful for this is the incredible energy that is generated by having it happen in three different rooms within the same facility. It's uh, very much like going to a festival where you go to one room, oh, they're doing, they're doing the class level over here, and you, you walk over to the next room, oh, cool, there's, there's, there's some mainstream thing here, and oh, that's plus over here. And the, the energy that is generated over there, um, we, we, our big festival of the year is uh, called Waska. And the Waska Festival is our the Washington area Square Dance Cooperative. So, da, da, da. and they uh, they pr- promote a festival every year. And I heard one dancer refer to it as oh, you can walk through the hall here and uh, get a Waska high. <laughs> so the uh, the energy that is that is uh, generated within this thing uh, that that night after I saw it, I was I was questioning my uh, my judgment whether or not I should have uh, turned them down the first time they asked me to to join. Uh, when Bill Addison passed away. Um, I really didn't have to think about it at all. I said, this, this is an excellent program, and I will commit another night of the week to this program because it was worth it. So you can make this happen in three different facilities if you like, but the energy that is generated by having all three, cl- <coughs> excuse me, all three classes at the same time um, and all the, uh, the, the high-quality angels, and these angels are... Uh, are, are are invited to be angels. They, you don't just come in and say, hey, I'm going to angel your class uh, and, and check out the new meat while I'm at it. Um, 
you, you, these angels are invited. The uh, the people in the council are high quality, high energy uh, uh, square dance uh, leaders in the area. So you know you, the 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 new people that come in are instantly impressed by the quality of people that are working in this program, and I think that's part of what makes it work. Steve, you're on, or whoever else. Bruce, I think Bruce brought up a good point. I, we find the same kind of energy on our night because we've got two groups. People are coming in, they're coming out, they're coming at different times, they're leaving at different times. We always have food. Someone in the club brings food. Um, we have people, some lady makes some brownies, she brings those in. There's a table in the back, and it's a round circular table, and people always stand around that table and eat and talk and and. I make the evening like a dance. I call singing calls to every in every tip. I I just if it's if we have a special night, uh, we just recently had uh, St. Patrick's Day. Everybody wears green. You know, I've got balloons. There's some decorations. We have a good time. We make it a party atmosphere. If you do that, people come. They really enjoy that festive atmosphere. You guys have a unique situation because of the uh, uh, because of the facility where you can have that kind of energy. That's that's super. Nasha, you want to pass it all back, sure. My name is Maisie Stevenson. I'm from Fairfax, Virginia. I belong with these guys. They talked about the technical parts of it and how it works and all that. I'm going to tell you about the fun part. Every three months we have a graduation. Each class is graduating to the next level. We have opened up all the doors. They bring finger foods. We make a big party out of it where everybody's eating and laughing. They dress in their square dance attire and they dance all three classes dance together. Of course, we're dancing the basic level, but the plus people don't care. The mainstream don't care as long as they're all dancing together and having a good time. And that's the fun part. They can actually see then the square dance community and how, how much fun it is and how much fun they have together, no matter what level they're dancing. That's that's a that's a real good point because I think when you can have one time one festive night where everybody dances together like that we do the same thing in graduation we have everybody come for the whole night we have them for a year oh that's great well, we'll have we have three a year and and uh, and actually what I do is I'll alternate tips between our basic group and our plus group that particular night uh, they bring more food there's decorations I'll do some line dancing I'll do a, a, a circle mixer I'll do the cotton eye Joe I'll do a round dance whatever we just make it a party night and it's a, it's a festive graduation we always got some kind of gag uh, the the people that coordinate each class always set them the graduating class up to do some kind of either play a trick on on me or somebody else, or and and we just have a good time with it. I think that's part of the atmosphere that you can create and make it make it this program really work. Chuck, did you have something to add? Yeah, I'm Chuck Myers, and I just from Pensacola. I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Uh, what effort are we doing as a Caller Lab? I guess I would say to get this to United Square Dancers of America or Legacy or something to start having this enthusiastic type of recruiting program, a dancer program, and everything else, starting to push down into the dancer community so that they also will begin to have that same enthusiasm that we have for this kind of a program. Is there anything working from that particular angle? I think we can always do uh, more work in that area. I know that uh, Dr. Seastrom and I have uh, been working on multi-cycle um, we developed the document that everyone's got by now and all have read. You promised to read tonight. Um, we've published in direction, you know, how, how we should uh, all get this. Do, do you have any feel for how many of these that have been passed out? I don't know. Yeah, I, I know that there has been hundreds of them over the last year or so. That right. And and part of that, we had uh, articles in American Square Dance. It seemed like uh, once every month, you know, uh, we, we put a lot of articles in yeah, American Square Dance. There's the articles in the Legacy Club Leadership Journal. So the deal is that, that like if you snooze, you lose, and, and you and you fall back just a little bit. And still, it's we've talked constantly about multi-cycle at nationals. Um, at at uh, did did you do it for USA West? I, I, I did a know. seminar there. We do. We, right. We've talked. Okay, so so we talk and we preach and preach and and still every day someone will come up to me and say. What's this multi-cycle thing? And I've only been talking about it for five years, you know. And 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 so there there is more efforts that we can do, and we'd we'd love to um, welcome, you know, your ideas of where we can publish it. Would really, you know, like if if you're retired or something, don't have nothing to do, we'd love to uh, 
for you to take that committee. You know, <laughs> uh, actually, I've uh, I've written articles for several um, magazines, local magazines, callers, note services, and such on this multi-cycle um, program. Uh, very, it's hard to get the the feel for it just reading it, and and so I think it, it's it, it's great to be able to have uh, more people go around and talk about it. Uh, I think you've got a great program going. It's unique because you have a unique facility. Um, Dana has a whole different set of circumstances, but he and Donna have something that's working for them. And, and I think the important thing is, is, is tailor it to meet your needs and the facility and the time span that you have in your area. There's an awful lot of ways that you can do this. And and, and tweak it just a little bit. Every once in a while you need to say, well, let's try this this next time. This might work a little bit better. Uh, there's a number of different ways that it's even being run in, in Southern California, but it's taken us about three and a half years now, and we've got just now to the point where we have about 10 clubs in a 10-mile area that are starting to do this program on a regular basis. And, and because our midway point is the basic program all of these different clubs and the several of us callers are involved are now starting to put together basic dances on a Friday or Saturday night. And we're just starting to see these programs for these new dancers begin to develop. I'm excited because it's a basic dance. Even if the people are a little bit farther along in the phase, we don't call another mainstream tip or anything. We, we call basic. We put the wind in their face and more and more callers are committing to come out uh, initially just giving of their time. We want this program to work. We don't care how many dances, but we're finding that these dances are really real successful, and club people are starting to come and say, I don't care, it's like a halfway dance, this is a great time, we come out and dance, and so we're starting to see this basic dance develop, and we're looking forward to this expanding as more and more people are doing this program. We think it could be something in the future that, that will expand, and possibly we'll have a dancer base just at that program. Bill? Uh, Bill Donahue, Pensacola, Florida. Uh, another possible direction that could be taken, which I'm experimenting with, I have been doing for quite a long while in California, but in, Pens in Pensacola I haven't done it except on a very limited basis, is a exhilarated program which takes the people into a weekend which gives them about 18 hours of dancing. And then the remaining three weeks of that month takes them into the next nine hours so equivalent well 24 to 26 hours of dancing in 30 days it'd be like a crash course well it is a crash yeah. course but it's, an, but it's on a possible solution because you're getting them at one time on one weekend where they're learning constantly basics things that they should know to start with and then you can continue on for the remaining of the month to continue on to get them into the basic program or the possible wherever you want to end up at and then you can start that again in 30 days, which means that you can have a continuous program going all the time if you wish, if you have a facility to do it. That'd be tremendous. The key here, again, is, is, to, is, is we're opening up the opportunity for people to join us more times than once a year. And I think that's the real key. It makes a big difference, and, and the energy is right there. Roy Gotta from New Jersey. I have three questions. I'll ask all three, and then you can address them in any order, whatever you want. Mike, you kind of answered one of them, and that was you're teaching in three phases, whatever you want to call it. And if you have people, let's say when they have finished the basic program and they've reached this milestone and they're happy with it, are you going to be providing a place for people who don't wish to go to the next plateau. In other words, suppose you have a group of people that are happy there. It's like a family, for instance. Are you, are, in other words, in California and, and the D.C. area where you say there are no mainstream, uh, are you going to create basic for people who, because uh, we, we run into that a little bit, people don't want to go far. They're happy. They want to come out once a month, bring their, their family because they learn with their kids. We're encouraging that. And uh, so are you going to have that? Second question is, when the people enter your program in these areas where basically your goal is plus, do they know in advance that, all right, we have you here, we're going to hopefully keep you for the next nine months? Do they know that up front? And the third question is more towards the D.C. people, who I know a lot of you, and I realize there are a few mainstream clubs, but your goal is to teach to plus in the one year. But when they reach that mainstream plateau, are they encouraged to go to the mainstream clubs that you have and 
are you letting them go or are you pressuring them to keep going into the plus? In other words, do you just say, hey, you can go and dance here and, and that's fine with us and maybe you should do that and that whole thing? Because one of the emphasis at this convention is the promotion of more of the basic than the mainstream clubs. And I just want to know if you're addressing that also. Uh, just... To answer your question regarding, you know, are we providing dances for these people? We're just getting to that point in, in our area because this program that I do is is, is run and, and predominantly the energy is with a particular club. Yes, they want those people to come all the way to their program and dance. They are doing alternate tips with their dances, mainstream and plus. And I think it it because of that, these people can come and dance with the club right away. They're included in club activities. They could come to every club dance, and if they only wanted to go any farther than mainstream, yes, they would just dance every other tip of the club dance. Uh, I have students and, and have for the last couple of years that only go through the first phase and maybe a little bit into mainstream, and because there's now mainstream dances in the area, they can go to those dances, they can go to club dances, and they just don't seem to get any farther than that. They're repeating this, this second phase again and again. I have even some students that are repeating the first phase, and, and because they like that phase, we are just getting to the point after three years where we will, we will be having regular basic dances. And so we, But the, the idea is to bring them into the club format if we can. It, particularly if it's, if it's dancer-generated uh, leadership and energy with a the club, they're going to want those people to go all the way. I do not tell them they're going to spend a whole year in lessons. I don't use the word lessons. And I think this is something that we're moving away from, and I think most of you know, we don't really use the word lessons. It's a new dancer dance. I welcome them to the Tuesday night Valley Trailers New Dancer Dances. Come on out and dance. We're just, and I make it like a dance, and we make it like a party, you know? I think that's the key. If we just drill into their head that, that they're that they're students and they're coming for lessons and you know some people just think oh, i don't need this just come and dance and i think that's a real key steve do you guys want to add to that yes we also in the washington area have a class level series that's run by our callers association which primarily supports only the fall class and so they get dancing right along through may on that particular program we have uh with a number of angels, they're all from various clubs. Uh, the clubs around the area are also creating special dances for the classes to come to, and we advertise those there also. Uh, we haven't got to trying to find any other way of doing that, but there are other options that we could certainly do to create more dancing opportunities for them. Thank Okay, there's uh, a couple of things here. Uh, the Callers Association uh, is now looking into the idea of supporting, uh, in, in support of the T2000 concept, uh, looking into the idea of uh, creating some basic clubs and seeing how we can, how we can make that happen. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention, uh, which had not really occurred to me, is as we are teaching these students, uh, one of the things that I will say is uh, when I t first teach them spin the top, I say half by the right centers cast three quarters. Remember, you're going to remember that. Remember it because you're going to see it over and over and over again in future programs. And somebody pointed out to me that this was not a good thing because we are making a suggestion to the students that they're going to need to go on to another program or they're going to want to go on to another program. Um, I instantly saw the flaw in my, uh, in my habits and uh, I'm going to make an effort for now on to uh, not say anything about another program and to, uh, even though all along I've been saying, you know, there's no, don't feel any obligation to go on, there's no reason to go on, you don't need to go on. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, two or three uh, ba uh, mainstream clubs in the area. One of them has uh, dances uh, 7 to 10 squares and sometimes 12 and 15 squares on a Saturday night. Um, in our area, so we certainly have a flourishing or at least a, a live uh, mainstream program in our area. But uh, and of course, and I, I mentioned that to my to my class as I graduated mainstream. But uh, let's let's try to make a conscientious effort to suggest to them that they do not need to go on, that there will be a place for them when they've graduated, at least at mainstream. And like I say, our callers association is looking into doing something about uh, the basic program. Dana. Uh, just to answer part of the question, yes, we're looking at also providing a different program for the dancers that are a few weeks into it. We tried it last year on the basics. We, we got our area is a mainstream area. There's hardly any plus whatsoever in our area. Mainstream is the dance level. We um, Last year we tried basic group due to logistics and 
some hall problems. We finally just threw in the towel on it. We're going to try it again, though. It's not one of those things we're, we're not going to try again. It's, it's feasible, and we think it should be out there for those dancers that feel comfortable at the level they're dancing at that time. And um, I think it's also a fun program, really. Um, we also talked about um, the commitment. We uh, One thing, you never want to give up on a class because um, you never know who's going to be your best recruiters. We did a class, three people one time. Club kind of, well, do we want to go ahead with this? We found a basement. When somebody's home went to the basement, took these three people. One person in that group was a PE teacher. She arranged for us to get free publication for advertisement in their school. Pamphlets went out to 500 homes in the area. We had, she arranged for free lessons at a, a, a school auditorium. We didn't have to pay rent or nothing for the auditorium. We had quite a few people show up for that. Uh, she also arranged later on to get us into a recreation center that we tried for years to get into. She went over and talked to the director, got us in, no problem. Rent is hardly nothing at all. And it's been that one person. If I'd said, no, we're not going to do lessons because there's only three people in the class, we would have missed out on all that. So you can't just throw in the towel and say, well, we only have three people. We're not going to do it. Try away and find a way of doing it because that, that one person might be the one you need. The three... The three questions that uh, Mr. Ghana asked, I believe the first one was, are, do you plan to create basic dances so that people don't have to go all the way to plus? Is that more or less what you asked? Or is that... Okay. Um, with, with all due respect, that, that, that is a question that's good to be considered whether or not you're using a multi-cycle program. It, it, it doesn't bear any special significance because it's a multi-cycle program. You're going to start a class once a century. Are they going to have basic dances? Uh, the second question w uh, was, do new dancers uh, have any idea how long the class lasts? And, and again, uh, that's an interesting issue to address, uh, whether or not it's a multi-cycle deal. That, you, you've raised a, a meta issue. That's what it is, a meta issue. And the, and the third question, um, can they start like going to open mainstream dances before they finish plus? And, and, uh, no, no, that wasn't the question. That the qu what, was the, what was the third question? <laughs> The third question was, when they get to mainstream, do you let them know there are mainstream clubs you can go to and you don't have to continue with us? There's these mainstream clubs that are there for you now. That was basically the question. And, and again, those issues uh, apply whether or not you're running a multi-cycle thing. I think, really, the main difference in the multi-cycle is that, that if you grow your club by trickling in a few people uh, every couple of weeks, uh, you're going to end up dominating the square dance scene uh, in your area, provided that you live in a small town. <laughs> like they'll say, <coughs> like, not, like Nasser said, that those same issues, you know, or whether you have a multi-cycle program or not. But we try, and I, and I make announcements all through my class. Anytime a caller has a special dance going on or a new dancer dance or a halfway dance or whatever, I announce that at my class. I try to get those those uh, new dancers out there dancing as many times as I can and, and to make them know that there's other places available to dance. I think I don't ever feel like these are our dancers and I don't want to insulate them from everybody else. I want these people out there dancing. They're going to go where they're going to go in eventually. And uh, what's important is that they're just part of the dance community in, in the area. And I think if we keep that attitude and we all work together a little bit better, we're going to not only keep these dancers, but we're going to increase their enthusiasm for the activity and they're going to bring their friends. And as Dana had mentioned, sometimes one person like this can open up a lot of doors along down the line for you, so it makes a big, big difference. And, and again, the, what, the point I wanted to make is that your questions apply whether or not you're using a multi-cycle, but since you'd asked the question, the first question, would you create basic dances in your area, I would say no. Um, would you tell new dancers how long class lasts, I, I would say no. And uh, would you encourage people to start uh, going to mainstream dances when they're ready? Uh, I, I would say yes. That, that's the way I would run my program. A couple other thoughts I'd like to mention, too. Somebody brings to mind about square dance clothing. We don't necessarily have people dress in square dance clothing. They don't have to come. Our angels don't have to come in square dance clothing. I recommend the guys come in long sleeves and comfortable dancing shoes. And, and a lot of our angels come right from work because the class starts early at 7 o'clock so they don't dress up. And, and you know some of the guys will come in a suit and take off their tie and throw their coat down and, and dance as an angel. 
uh, and, and, it, and it just works out. It's interesting, though, that about once a month, the club brings in what they call a recycle rack. And there's another room just off the, the hall. And and anybody that, that has square dance clothes that they no longer wear, they've grown out of, whatever, they bring them to the couple that's in charge of the recycle rack. And and the, the gal that, that she'll do any kind of mending, she'll clean, she'll wash it, she'll hang these things up in the other room... And our class members will wander in, and they might see a shirt for five bucks or a dress for ten bucks or something. And and all of a sudden, the dancers begin to wear clothes. So even during the class, we make it available. It's not mandatory. I've had people that don't dress, you know, even all the way through class. But we find that there's just a natural tendency, without shoving it down their throat, for people to wear, begin to wear some clothing. And I think that we've got a. a a big area that that we can change a little bit of our thinking on in as far as square dance attire, depending on what's predominant in your area. We're seeing a lot of new styles come out, and and that's not a major issue. We don't make it an issue. We don't drive it down their throats, and I think it works a lot better when you do it that way. You mean square dance clothes, don't you? Square dance clothes. Okay. You were saying clothing, and uh, I was hoping they wore clothes. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We... <laughs> As far as uh, going back to a question over here a while ago, too, we were talking about how are we getting this out there for people. This is no secret. I think this is the first good step in the right direction. Uh, as I said before, I've been doing this for 20 years in our area, and I've not kept it a secret. Everyone knows we've been doing numbers of lessons, but I'm still the only one in our area that's doing those lessons. Why? I don't know, because I think our, our program is showing success. And I have not been able to talk to the callers in the trying or uh, helping. I have, I have had a program a couple of times where I've had new new callers come out and, and assist me, um, because of dance schedules and so forth. And I let them have one night every other week. They have a night that they could help. Uh, that doesn't always fall into my schedule. It'll help that way, but it does add a little bit of flavor for those new callers. Gives them a chance to try calling, and it doesn't really hurt the class either to have a different voice to hear every once in a while. I love it. Anytime you can bring another caller that, that comes through or something to do a tip, uh, I think it's great. I have a couple people in my in the club that, that enjoy to do one tip every now and then or a singing call, and I bring them at graduation time, and I, I do the patter, they do the singing call, we sing together, whatever. We Make it a party. Make it fun, and, and you can really get the people's energy into it. I just wanted to mention that I had written an article for American Square Dance Magazine. It's an article that I published in a note service previously, and when I submitted it, Ed Juari sent it back, and he said to me, he said, Mike, he said, there's a lot of places where you use the term class. There's a lot of places where you use the term phase one because we call it phase one and phase two. Some people might mistake this for round dancing phase one and phase two. I said, okay. So I went back through the article. I changed the names. Instead of class, I put new dancer dance. And instead of uh, phase one, phase two, I put cycle one, cycle two. I don't care the names. But but, but there, there's a point. There are, it's in some of our terminology, I don't think we realize that it can be demeaning to people when we call them students instead of new dancers. They're dancers. They dance the first night they come to class. So we can change a little bit of our attitude and a little bit of, uh, of the way we think of things. And I think a little thing like that, a word here and there, can make a big difference. Stephen Cole from Fairborn, Ohio again, and my question has to do with teaching order. Um, I'm now, I'm a new caller and I'm working on, on putting together a class and I've got the Caller Lab prescribed teaching order. Do you rearrange this to fit in these 10 and 12 uh, week cycles to, to mix and match calls a little bit better for uh, these two hour sessions or do you go with the straight order as it is prescribed by Caller Lab today? Well. From my standpoint, I pretty much go by the straight order. I vary a little bit from time to time in, in each class, depending upon my group, and I switch around and I try something a little bit different. And, and uh, uh, because I think we can all grow as teachers and and, uh, and change a little bit, but I pretty much go right down the order. Now, in a twelve-week cycle or an eight-week cycle, I'm not sure you might be able to. Um, I used to that. use the uh, I used to use an order called the L I S S T, the list order from uh, the San Francisco area or somewhere. Uh, what happens when I was like sick or or gone or something and another guy had to come in he couldn't keep up with where I was because he was unfamiliar with it so the teaching order really is not that big of a deal so just for the sake of simplicity so another guy could fill your shoes uh, I just went to the straight caller lab order just check them off and, and everyone knows what that is I pretty much follow the same rules I go right down the list there are some variations I change and, and without getting into a, a big discussion on that there are things I prefer to do before other calls but I pretty much go down the list and that's not because of the 10, 12 week concept because that's my teaching preference. The, the 
comment that Nasser was making about the list, L-I-S-S-T, is a teaching order based upon the frequency of the call. In other words, the calls have been tabulated over the years, and, and how frequently they're called, they're put on a teaching order, and they're taught accordingly. And in the San Francisco area, they have done that for a long time. Bill Davis is primarily uh, the person behind that. Some people like that particular order, but I find that, that, that as Nasser said, if you have somebody fill in, it's a lot easier if you're just going down the, the program. And uh, it's interesting because the, the fellow that I that started this initially in our area was with the ACA and it was teaching the ACA program. And I thought it was kind of ironic that the club is dancing plus and uh, he's teaching the ACA program. I just took that down and I teach the basic program the first 17 weeks and mainstream and plus the second 17 weeks. Will? Thank you. Uh, Will Leeds from Southern California. Just one comment on that. Uh, when you're teaching, the one thing you want to remember especially if your dancers are going to go out and dance at a certain level with other clubs. And, and, and down in our area, a lot of the clubs have their halfway hoedown, so to speak, and, and uh, we should be at a number so-and-so on the list um, for this dance. So it would pay you most times to stay pretty close to the list, especially complete the basic list before you start into the mainstream, complete the mainstream before you start into the plus, et cetera. Uh, you don't have to go word one by one to stay with it. Um, it's easy to do that way, and, but you can bounce around a little bit. But make sure that you you complete the basic before you get into the mainstream, etc. There's also several of the clubs that in in our area teach the old standard, start in September, end in May and June. And my September class, although it's only an hour and a half long, stays right with those guys, so they can go to their halfway dances, and we can interchange dances. And and I've got people that come to my class, and my class I encourage them to go to. Hey, there's another dance night on Thursday night, and I encourage them to go over there and pick up a second night if they can. I, I it's accelerated slightly but I I use demos every night that I get in the first tip is warm up we kind of go through some of the stuff I don't need to teach any of the calls that I taught last week I get a demo square right up after that I show them some of the calls that we taught last week just as a revision review um, I get a I I show them and talk to them of the calls that I'm going to teach that night. There are about a third of the people in your class that learn by vision or can see things by vision, and you're picking up those people right away. So then the, the next tip, I immediately review the stuff, and if I can teach something, that that particular tip on the second tip, I do that. Uh, I, I sometimes get on the floor myself um, during the class, right in between tips. I put on my portable mic. I go out with another couple. We show styling. Uh, I show people how to swing. I, do, I I, I'm busy during in the middle of the class in between tips as well as, as the tips themselves. And I think you can get all the information in there that you can in a two-hour segment or a two-and-a-half-hour segment. It's just a little bit more energy, and there's a lot of, lot of things you can do in between the tips. And it makes it fun. It's really festive. Any other comments? Questions? Yeah, Roy. We're going to wind it up and go to lunch here pretty quick. Uh, just a quick comment on, on terminology since we're kind of talking about recruitment and retention here. And you talk about, you know, using words that discourage people from coming and staying like classes and lessons and student and all that. In New Jersey, we've discovered, because we encourage spectators at our festivals and stuff like that, we don't use the word spectator anymore. People come in, we have to give them some sort of identification for... Um, insurance purposes and um, we charge them a dollar to come in the hall and then we give it back to them when they leave the hall so since they paid to come in they're covered with insurance but we give them a ribbon that says we give them a ribbon that says newcomer doesn't say spectator and people have commented that, well that's nice what do you mean by that well hello and we get to talk to them so uh, just consider the words you use and the things you give to people very good Roy Listen, we want to thank you for coming out. We want to encourage you to try these programs. If you have any questions, please talk to Nasser or, or Dana and Donna. Uh, any of us during the convention, we'd love to talk to you a little bit more about uh, these programs. If you're running a program, we'd love to hear about it. And the more information that we can get out about this way of teaching opens up the opportunity for new people to join our activity. And marketing people have told us for years, if you only offer it once a year, you don't have a product. And if you can offer it multiple times, it makes a big, big difference. Dana? Yes, well, I want to thank you, Mike, and, and Nasser, and all of you being here. Um, also, as you picked up, hopefully, from this, this meeting, is there's a lot of enthusiasm for this program. There's a lot of enthusiasm. We all are really hyped on it. I've been doing it for 20 years, and I'm still hyped on it. Um, and the more I talk to these guys, it gets me more hyped on it. So get out there and, and use it. We encourage you to, and anything we can do to help, uh, please give us a call or whatever. Uh, the address on that brochure is actually wrong for me, but my number's on the 
caller lab list so you can always get a hold of it. Again, we're glad you chose to... St- to spend your morning studying about multi-cycle when you're filling out your convention critique sheet and it asks you about the best plan, the best session, it, remember there's a dash in multi-cycle and, and uh... <laughs> thank you guys have a good convention, okay? <laughs>